The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello, my name is James, and welcome back to The Learning Circuit. As you can tell, I'm not Karen. This video is part two of my series on polymer capacitors. If you are totally new to capacitors, you will want to check out Karen's video on them. She did a great job covering the basics. You'll also want to take a look at my previous video, which introduced these special capacitors called polymers. Now in this video, I am making measurements in real circuits before and after swapping out capacitor types. There is a ton I want to cover, but I will give a very quick review of polymers first. Even though we call these capacitors polymers, that material is part of the cathode layer. There are two major types which use either aluminum or tantalum as the anode, with their oxide as the dielectric. Polymers or polymer electrolytics offer low ESR, high capacitance, and long operational life. Unlike ceramic capacitors, they do not change with applied voltage or significantly drift with temperature or time. See? I told you it would be quick. Now I'll slow down so that we can talk about how we will measure them. The first project addresses the idea of replacing a ceramic or MLCC with a polymer capacitor. At the time of this video, there's a shortage of high capacitance ceramics. So a common task is trying to replace a ceramic with a polymer in an existing design. To simulate such a task, I am replacing the output ceramic capacitor in an evaluation board available from TI. This board has a TPS 62097 step-down converter. The input can take up to 6 volts and it is configured for 1.2 volts out. For my testing, I'll be using 2.5 volts in and a load of 1 ohm, which will drive about 1 amp through the board. For the second measurement comparison, I'm going back to one of my favorite 8-bit computers, the Commodore 64. It has some traditional aluminum electrolytics that I'm going to replace with polymers to see if it changes how the onboard power supplies behave. In both cases, I am measuring a DC or rail voltage or more correctly, the peak-to-peak -peak noise on top of that rail. Next, I will explain how to make this measurement with an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is great for measuring the peak-to-peak -peak noise, or the AC component of a DC voltage rail. For the DC-to-DC -DC converter, I soldered this pigtail coax to my board. When using a coax cable like this one, you must be careful not to exceed the scope's maximum input voltage since it is a one-to-one -one attenuation. Some scope companies even make a special power rail probe specifically for this measurement, which will solve that voltage problem, as well as a few others. The cable then connects to the special probe. When we get to measuring the C64's rail voltages, I will use a browser version of this special probe. The TI board comes with a 22 microfarad ceramic capacitor on the output of the regulator. We need to measure its performance for a baseline. I hook up the board, turn on the input voltage, and look at the scope. Here we see the 1.2 volts out and that there is a little bit of noise on the rail. The peak to peak measurement shows about 40 millivolts of noise, which sounds high to me. I want more resolution for that peak to peak measurement. so. I offset the signal to the center of the screen and crank up the volts per division. Now there is a lot more detail to the peak-to-peak -peak noise. Also notice that the measurement value dropped a bit. This change is because the scope is getting more vertical resolution around the part of the signal we care about. Let's see what happens when the load is turned on. Wow! Check out all those spikes. They force the peak-to-peak -peak voltage up to 157 millivolts. On a 1.2 volt signal, that's like a 13% change in margin. Before we criticize this board design, let's consider a couple of things. First, this is an evaluation module. It's meant to allow somebody to see if this chip will work in their application. There are multiple modes and other configurations that we could be using, which may change its performance. Second, the electronic load that I'm using isn't perfectly resistive and is being connected with relatively long wires. 
The purpose of this comparison test is to simulate a real-world case of trying to change capacitors in an existing design. With the baseline performance established, I carefully remove the ceramic capacitor and then replace it with a 22 microfarad polymer talum. By the way, talum capacitors mark their anode and aluminum capacitors mark their cathode. I guess they just want it to be different. With the polymer talum, the no load regular output has 31 millivolts of ripple. That is a big increase from the ceramics 18 millivolts with no load. What do you think is going to happen when we turn the load on? Let's go see. The transient spikes drive the peak-to-peak -peak noise up to 130 millivolts. Now remember, the ceramic capacitor was at 157 millivolts, so the polymer reduced the spikes by 17%. The ESR of the polymer is higher than the ceramic. Normally, this would result in a larger voltage drop across the capacitor, increasing the ripple voltage. I think what we are seeing is that the polymer's ESR is dampening the switching transients. As an experiment, I decided to try adding a 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitor onto one of the extra pads. Look at the performance now. The transients are significantly reduced and the peak-to-peak -peak voltage has dropped to 19 millivolts. I know what you're thinking. The bald engineer just said, in order to replace a ceramic capacitor, replace it with a ceramic capacitor. Technically that is correct, which by the way is the best kind of correct. However, what I am suggesting is that you always consider a small value ceramic for reducing switching noise. And in this case, a 50 volt 100 nanofarad 0805 ceramic are still easy to come by because they are by far the most popular capacitor produced. Oh, and before moving on, I did go back and put the 22 microfarad ceramic into the board with the 100 nanofarad to see what it looked like. And we can see that its performance dramatically improved as well. So what have we learned about polymers in a switching DC to DC converter? First, even if you can get the same case size, voltage, and capacitance value, these are not drop-in replacements for a ceramic. A switching converter will operate differently, so you need to verify its operation. Second, it is also possible that a polymer alone could improve the performance of a circuit. And third, always consider low value filter capacitors when designing your boards. Just in case my friends Eric and Steve watch this video, I do need to mention that measuring the peak to peak voltage of a regulator's output is only one of many measurements that need to be made. To truly evaluate a capacitor's performance in a converter, you would need to measure things like the power supply rejection ratio, or its control loop stability, or its parameters across things like temperature. But I'm going to have to save those measurements for another video. Let's move on to see how aluminum polymers function when replacing traditional aluminum electrolytics in a design that uses linear regulators. Here is one of my many Commodore 64 motherboards. On it are three huge traditional aluminum electrolytic capacitors. Back on a Workbench Wednesdays episode, I replaced those capacitors with polymer aluminums using some cool soldering tools. The leads for this capacitor are on the same axis, so they are called an axial capacitor. While these are called a radial since the leads, um, hmm, I don't know, something about the radius of a circle? Yeah, I don't know why they're called radials. I couldn't find a polymer with an axial configuration, so that meant I had to use radials and get creative with my soldering, which you'll see later. But before we get to that, I wanna talk about three measurement points. They are the 5 and 12 volt outputs of the linear regulators, as well as the 12 volt regulators input. Oh, and make sure you check the show notes for a post I put together on C90. It's an electrolytic that looks like AC is being directly applied to it. To make measurements easier, I'm going to measure the 12 volt and 5 volt rails using their C102 and C57s on the board. While I am measuring the voltages, to give the C64 something to do, it is running a dead cart test. The computer is actually fine, I just need to distract it with something while I poke at it. First up is the 5 volt rail. Even though this is a linear regulator, look at the pattern in its ripple voltage. It is clear that as the C64 performs different operations, it causes changes in the current draw, which creates the overall ripple, which with the original capacitors is around 24 millivolts peak to peak. I 
probably should point out that I'm not using the original Commodore 64 supply. Instead, I'm using a modern replacement, but I don't expect that to change these results. The 12 volt supply has a similar looking pattern with a peak to peak voltage of about 30 millivolts. What is more interesting is to go and look at the input side of the 12 volt supply. That's 60 Hertz. Isn't it amazing that the linear regulator is almost entirely eliminating that signal from the output? Granted, the peak to peak change is only about 1.18 volts, but it still means that the regulator is working hard. Now it is time for me to do a little bit of soldering to replace the original capacitors. Once again, I'll check the 5 volt output first. And it's about the same as before. That's weird. Let's go check the 12 volt supply. <laughs> okay, it's actually a little bit more. Wow. That's not something I expected, or is it? Switching the polymers did change the output ripple a little bit, but that's not the big impact. These capacitors are on the input of the regulators. So let's go take another look at that 12 volt input again. And now we see it dropped by about 100 millivolts. You might say that a 10% reduction isn't very much, but any voltage ripple we remove on the input means that the regulator does not have to work as hard on the output. Speaking of output, let's go change the electrolytic capacitors on the linear regulator's output side. And check out these numbers. The 5 volt rail dropped to about 13 millivolts, which is a serious drop. Less ripple on the 5 volt rail means a more stable system. To be honest, this is the kind of change I was hoping to see, a 30% improvement just by switching to a polymer. Now, you might be eager to point out that these caps are 40 years old, so maybe some of the improvement is just from them being newer capacitors. Let's go check. Using my DMM, I measured the capacitance is 10.47 microfarads for a 10 microfarad capacitor, so that's a good sign. But the other measurement we need to consider is the leakage current. That measurement tells us the state of the dielectric and the life left in the electrolyte it should be less than 500 nanoamps. To measure that, I applied 5 volts DC to the capacitor with a 10 milliamp limit. Then I waited one minute to see that the leakage was about 140 nanoamps. These two measurements tells me that the dielectric and the electrolyte are still in workable shape. So I think it's safe to say that most of the improvement came from the fact that we used a polymer capacitor type. Just like with my previous episode on polymer capacitors, if you'd like to ask questions, please head over to Element 14. There is a link in the description and we'll put one on screen right now. At that link, I will also include a ton of scope screenshots and details from the measurements that I showed. There are a few bits that I left out for time, so you may be interested to check that out. In summary, the biggest challenge with using polymers in existing hardware is their physical form factors. From an electrical perspective, we saw that the impedance of a polymer will have an effect on your circuit, so you'll need to do some testing to see how well they work. However, it's been my experience that if they're designed in from the beginning, there will not be many issues. I hope you enjoyed the measurements and learned something about polymers along the way. Thank you for watching. Again, if you have questions, please come find me on the Element 14 community.